Hello, welcome to another edition of Low Code Cafe. This is episode number 158 for March 27, 2024. Today we're talking about Plant an App and the new features that we are about to release in version 1.26. So uh, that ought to be an interesting discussion. Lots of uh, help from the Plant and App product team going to be on this call. I am Dale Warner, head of support for Plant and App. We've got uh, Bogdan Letescu, uh, CEO and founder, and uh, Peter Shopman, who is um, product manager for Plant and App. So lots of good discussion going on today. Um, this is an event that we do um, bi-weekly every other Wednesday at this hour, and uh, it's an, a community webinar where we either update you or provide demos. Most of the time we do a lot of hands-on coding, but uh, we'll get stories and tips from the team and the community in here as well. So we invite you to join us every two weeks for this. We put all the past episodes, as soon as we get them done, out onto YouTube, so youtube.com slash app. You're welcome to go out and subscribe to that. Our agenda today, we'll, we've got two items. I have one uh, hotfix to talk about in the trenches of support, and then we'll go right on into uh, the features that are happening in version 1.26. So do engage with us. You can use the chat window or the question and answer. You can raise your hand if you want to talk. When it's all over with, there's a feedback form, and we invite you to use that. That link will be on the chat here in a minute. We do this uh, every other week, so the next live web webinar is two weeks from today on April 10th. And so now my brief uh, from the trenches of support we are at the tail end of our version 1.25. We've released a hot, a lot of hotfixes because this uh, release has been uh, in progress for a long time. Uh, so we've previously released 89 hotfixes, and we have one more going in today. The hotfix, and I really won't dig into it too much, uh, It's this is going to help people who... Um, use uh, the creation of dynamic controls in our form tool, the uh, add date time picker, picker action previously didn't have this checkbox for allow input, and now it does. So when you're dynamic, we've covered dynamic, uh, dynamically creating controls on the form in previous episodes of the Low Code Cafe. Uh, and, and it's where you can, where the form starts out one way, and then you can uh, add things dynamically depending on the conditions that you detect in your form. So if you're adding a date time picker, we didn't have this uh, checkbox available to, for you to use. So now it's in there. I suspect that was related to one particular project. Most of you probably won't need this particular enhancement. Every week we do low-code campfire, so that is on Fridays during the same hour, and the link to join that is going to be in on your clipboard in a minute as well. But it's a great hour that we spend with the low-code community. There's usually a couple of us from Plantanap, a lot of brilliant minds that uh, from people who have been using Pl uh, Plantanap for a long time from our community, and we often uh, answer your questions, solve issues, uh, help you think through problems. So we do encourage our uh, all of you to join us in the Low Code Campfire. These are the links. I'll put them on the chat in just a moment. Um, let's see. And uh, yep. Uh, just doing a little housekeeping here, making sure we have everybody available for us. So uh, here's the team. We're going to be talking about our new uh, Plant and App features and release schedule. Uh, Bogdan, I'm going to um, release the share and let you take over from here. Sounds good. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to show you the new goodies that we have in current release and uh, upcoming releases as well. Good. So uh, let's start a bit with, uh, with the current release. So it's been a big one. We started working on many different things uh, and actually took some things out to be able to release and some I'll speak about uh, because they will be part of the, of the following release. 
<clears throat> but major work has been done in many different areas of the product and will cover uh, will cover a big uh, part today between uh, me, Dale, and, uh, and Peter. Uh, the major areas that uh, were affected are the workflows, and you'll see uh, in the demo today uh, better experiences for uh, putting conditions on those arrows in conditional uh, gateways. But also we introduced a new, new gateway, the parallel gateway that opens so many poss possibilities for, for optimization. Uh, the UI, uh, we integrated the new uh, UI uh, for uh, creating actions that you've already seen in API and automation, now it's present in, uh, in workflows as well. We worked a lot on the on the parameters to, to so they can be documented, and that is a very cool feature. You, you'll see it as we go. I will highlight, as, uh, as I'll be in the demo, many other smaller things that uh, will improve the life of a local developer or the end user. <coughs> Another large area that we touched was the APIs, and actually, uh, starting with uh, 126, uh, will not support standalone API modules anymore. So everything will be migrated automatically in uh, in the uh, configuration, the app builder API screen, which now has a cleaner UI. There's also some cool new features where the URLs can be customized, which again opens so many different possibilities. And I will speak more about those as we get through the demo. The uh, the upgrade scripts also we invested a lot of time because uh, we have many experience with, with various upgrades failing for some reasons and not reporting when they fail properly. So this has uh, suffered a major rewrite in order to uh, at this stage to at least uh, understand exactly what's going on to, during the upgrade. And there is a follow up to that in 127 that will make the experience uh, very smooth. And there are so many more changes to the upgrade screen, to the licensing, caching, forms, listing, search. Uh, so uh, it will be a, it will be a cool session today. So right now we are scheduling where we are aiming that on Friday we'll be able to to open the beta on this release. So just a heads up, we'll cover it more in the uh, campfire on Friday. And the release date, depending on how the beta goes, because it's such a massive release, might be late April, early May. Uh, somewhere around that. So if you are not already part of the beta program and you want to get an early preview of everything that we are going to show today and contribute, making sure that it works on your instances, now is the time where we can fix it much easy, much easier than uh, after uh, releasing it. But uh, before jumping to the demo, uh, I would like to uh, give a bit of perspective. Uh, a bit uh, about what's come, what's coming, what are we working on uh, right now? <clears throat> so as I mentioned, and I think they will cover this and uh, sh show us a sneak preview of what's coming, but we are working on an upgrade progress page that is very detailed and shows everything that happens. So it's uh, it's very predictable uh, from from that uh, uh, stage that the uh, upgrade was successful or not with, uh, with various uh, levels of logging and so on. Uh, we are working also on rewriting the forms completely because uh, it's it's a very it's our most powerful tool, so to speak. But uh, it hasn't been in terms of uh, UI hasn't been modernized for a while. Also because of uh, it uses uh, Angular JS, which right now it's uh, it's not supported anymore. It's uh, not as secure. So the Forms 2.0 it's a complete rewrite. Modern technology, all the modern security issues are taken into account. Uh, because <clears throat> many of our customers right now are enterprise and we do pass through this uh, audit test. And uh, so far with the Forge 2.0, it scores uh, very, very high. Also, while we are doing this with all the lessons, all the feedback that we got from the community uh, and from, uh, from uh, customers in general along the time, we are uh, rebuilding it as a nicer drag and drop experience, visual experience. Uh, so uh, we can lower the bar for users that are able to create forms, right? Because right now our form is so powerful, but it requires a certain level of skill to to do to get started. Uh, the workflow contract is something that was actually done, but we decided not to include it in this, in this release because it's a, it's a major change. But basically, it's a it's a way to define a pattern for a group of workflows. So uh, in in development, you'd call these interfaces. Right? So you have the same input, same outputs for a group of workflows. The moment you decide that a workflow 
implements a contract, it cannot uh, suffer changes to those input and outputs. So this opens the, the door to many new possibilities to replace pieces of logic without affecting the, uh, the uh, bigger scope. So basically the coupling logic, you know, so, for example, in, in, in our AI product, we have uh, uh, workflows that are executed by the AI assistant. You know? So, let's say I want to open a support case, the AI assistant knows that executes a workflow that goes on the community, on the uh, help desk and opens a ticket, right? But we have so many different workflows, and from the AI perspective, they are all the same, they all have the same interface. So being able to replace those without changing all the application, that will, that will be a very powerful uh, thing for more complex applications. Uh, we are also uh, uh, going to, to uh, adopt the latest VNN version 9.13.3. Uh, we delayed this a bit because 9.13 had various issues until the dot three version. So this will be part of the 127 release. And we do have other Secret things that we work with, or work on, and we'll we'll uh, announce them in due time uh, when we get there. How so mysterious! We'll hope... Sorry. How Sorry. mysterious! Oh yes, yeah. It makes me want to know what you're talking about. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Good. Um, ideally, we'd want this to be a two three months time window, right? So we don't want this to get again into a one uh, year release, especially as uh, some of these things are already done. So. Uh, just, uh, just to give you a perspective on this. Good. <clears throat> and also, I thought I'd, I'd mention it because I know some, some people in our community, some of our customers already know, but <clears throat> thought I'd, I'd mention it again that we do have another product right now. It's called Bazinga, which is a platform, an AI platform for building uh, AI assistance and applications. You know, so it can be like uh, you see here a chatbot where you interact with it, it offers knowledge, but also can take actions. And the nice thing, they can be coupled directly to plant and app workflows. So it's, it's very, very powerful. Or it can be AI that is used behind the scenes in the processes to manipulate data uh, in, a, in a scenario where you have unstructured data, for example. Uh, good, so if, you, if AI becomes a thing uh, on your radar, on your backlog, for your customers, please reach out to us because from the feedback we received so far from our partners, from even Microsoft told us that we are probably one of the most advanced in terms of know-how on how to leverage AI to build real use cases, practical use cases. <laughs> With that being said, I will jump to the demo. Uh, are there any questions at this stage? Not yet, but that is a uh, a great point that the chat is open or the Q&A. You can use either one of those and we'll uh, insert questions to Bogdan. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, I started here with just a blank application. I did a bit of setup, so we have some data. We don't spend time creating some data. So just a simple support case entity with a title, description, and a status, which is a uh, linked entity. Just some new in progress and done. So nothing uh, nothing fancy here. So let's uh, start in the configuration screen. Uh, and I will jump directly, I will start with the, with the workflows, but along the way, I will point out how everything uh, ties uh, together. So um, let's create a new workflow. And <clears throat> Uh, maybe let's start with uh, with uh, showing uh, some improvements on the uh, input parameters and the conditional uh, gateway, and then we'll move to the to the uh, uh, parallel gateway. So let's start with the parameters. Let's say we want to uh, take in a support case. So same as you've been used uh, until now, we create a property of type uh, case. But now what you'll notice is already. Uh, some changes happen here. First, you have a description, which uh, really helps document what each input parameter does. And I will show you how this is also exposed in actions. You know, so now, uh, one using a workflow uh, can be unaware of what happens inside the workflow. It's, it's opaque. They just read the parameter, the description, and they are able to use a workflow just by, by, uh, by reading the help text that is written here. <clears throat> 
so let's say uh, we do this uh, this workflow. We call it uh, a start workflow, a start uh, uh, support. So basically, assigning the case to a person. So let's say uh, this is the case that it's uh, we assign something like that. Another nice thing here, you will notice, and maybe I will switch a bit to see. For example, if I put this to be a Boolean, this changes to a text box. If I put it to be a, a, a daytime, this changes to a daytime control, right? So now it's uh, it's uh, we enforce uh, the default value to be in the format of the input parameter, right? And then when I when I picked uh, this to be a support case, now I get here all the support cases, and I can search uh, by it. We are uh, working here to also make it possible to search by ID, so it's uh, it's uh, familiar to what we had so far. But again, being able to do something like that improves uh, improves the building experience quite quite a bit. So, so in this case, your case is entitled "Need Help." And yes, so that's yeah. why. So, if you had multiple cases, they'd be yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, this is the title of the support case. You are correct. Thank you for for stepping in. <clears throat> and the same thing uh, will be true for the output parameter, right? So, let's say uh, we output a a uh, Status, the new state of a ticket. So then, similar as before, let's say we do, we'll have a token, a new status, and then uh, we'll get to that bit, uh, to that in a bit. And then you can, uh, of course, document what will the output parameter do for the person either using this as an action or for the person that comes, or for yourself, because we all know when we develop things three months later, the questions pop up. What was I thinking here? <laughs> so that's that's what this solves. One of the problems that it solves. Right? <clears throat> so let's uh, let's call this uh, workflow maybe to to. Uh, to make it uh, uh, to make use of the conditionals and so on, we'll, we'll call this a progress case or move case forward to the next uh, next step. Uh, oh, so I didn't add. For now, I will not uh, do anything with it; just uh, saving it. Because along the way, uh, you'll notice some uh, nice improvements here. So you see, the page title tells me the workflow that I'm on. Right? So previously, you'd have all saying. Uh, configuration screen or something like that, but now it reflects the page you are on, right? So if I open a new tab, and unfortunately this uh, this uh, tab sits on top of my uh, Zoom sits on top of my tab, so I'll do this. Uh, so for example, if I go to entities, now I edit this, and you see I'm in the case entity, right? So when I have ten tabs like that, I can easily switch to see. Uh, to go back to a particular element I'm editing. Okay. Um, any any questions so far? They are clear. Okay. So let's maybe start with a simple uh, with a simple uh, uh, conditional gateway where if status is one, which it means new. We move it to status two. If state two is two, which means in progress, we move it to state three, which is done. Of course, the way we do this, we do use an exclusive gateway and then uh, doing some uh, uh, partial updates, uh, partially, uh, partially update case, where we send the status to. Uh, two in this case, and we'll work on the condition. So that will be the first branch, and then the second branch, same. And we'll put the status to three. Okay. <clears throat> and of course, we need to close this. So it's, uh, it's complete. Okay. So what happened here? 
uh, you see, we still have a placeholder here to, to set the condition. But now if I double click or if I click this icon, I will get a pop. So I no longer need to add, use that small area on the arrow to put a condition. You now I can put it, uh, I, I can put it here. This uh, status uh, equals to, it goes on this branch. And we also separated uh, the label from the condition because maybe this uh, is quite common that we'll end up with a complex expression here that every time you look at it, you have to wonder what does this do? So then uh, we can say, Cases in progress. So now on my arrow, it says cases in progress go here. You know, so it becomes the, the condition could be anything. I don't care when I look at this workflow. It's much readable to me that to know that it goes this way. Or here we'd say uh, it is new and same equally. Equal equals one. <laughs> Good. You already noticed a bit of uh, things. So at the top, we have the go to old view. And actually, when you uh, upgrade to 126, you'll probably be in the old view, not in the new view, because similar to how we did uh, to other screens in the first release, we make uh, we make the new view optional. And then in the next release, it will be the main one. And then in the following release, we'll remove this uh, entirely. <clears throat> What's happening here? While you're working to get there, I'll just mention that um... We're getting applause that people like the tab names as well as uh, those improvements to the way that we're doing the conditional split. Yeah. So yeah, <clears throat> apparently workflows created with a new view will likely not work in the old view because probably these conditions, but we'll check this out. Good. <clears throat> so this is uh, this uh, is to be aware of this uh, button, but also you'll notice on the new view, uh, and you already noticed when I click, you see this open very very fast, because in the <clears throat> so far it used to be like an iframe here that would load the old engine parameters that we had uh, in, in, in forever. You, you you knew it. This one is using the new parameter engine that you saw in uh, APIs in automation and so on. So this is uh, Angular. It loads directly in the application. So you see it, it's, uh, it opens instantly. Uh, and because we brought this engine, you also get the uh, extra capabilities that we put in, like the, uh, the IntelliSense. Right? So for example, here, I did a partial update. But of, of course, I miss putting the ID. So this would break. You know? So now I start using the uh, case input parameter and status. Nope. Sorry? You, want, you want the ID there, don't you? Ah, sure. I, I could do, probably leave it like this then. You are right. <laughs> okay. Um, and same same with uh, with uh, all sorts of uh, all sorts of tokens. So like you are used to, you know, I can access all the tokens that are built in or custom created in tokens, uh, I can access them from uh, from here. So uh, hopefully this will help reduce a lot of that copy pasting tokens around that we all got used to, uh, to ensure that tokens are not misspelled and things like that. Uh, maybe let me fix this one as well, because maybe we actually get to run this workflow and see how it's performing. <clears throat> because uh, now you'll notice that the test workflow window also uses the same inputs as the default value. So basically, we, we standardize this kind of inputs to always behave the same. So again, I can just select the support case instead of having to, to find an ID for it. Uh, of course, I didn't output a token from the workflow, but uh, I guess to, to see if it was working, we can just refresh this page to see that it moved to the in-progress uh, in progress stage. Okay. Um, 
the next thing that I want to show you, I think it's a very, very, very powerful uh, uh, feature, and that is the parallel gateways. So uh, maybe I'll continue working on this uh, workflow. So the parallel gateway behaves the same way as an exclusive gateway, except it doesn't need condition. It will have multiple branches that execute in parallel. And at the end, the workflow will wait for all the branches to complete execute. So this will be useful in conditions where uh, the uh, logic happens on another system. For example, when running a SQL query, that takes a long time. Maybe in parallel, you can do other things. So when the SQL query finishes, you already finished with the extra work. And then you create back a dependency and you take what the SQL did with what you did in the meantime and put it uh, and put it uh, together. Uh, I will not create a fancy scenario here, but maybe let's uh, do a SQL query that takes a long time to run. Uh, let me uh, bring the syntax, which is wait for delay, right? So this will take three sec seconds to run this uh, SQL query. <clears throat> and maybe to even demonstrate uh, uh, demonstrate uh, the uh, ability to run them in parallel. Let's create some tokens on each branch. So let's say this is the uh, the first branch. Let's set it to true. And we'll output this just to, to see it's working. And maybe on this other branch, we do some extra other work. And just say create public tokens. And we put it to, uh, we say second. Second. And then uh, we'll, we, I'll show you a more. Uh, uh, this, this uh, we are working on this to make it easier because basically you want them as separate uh, branches. And same as a uh, exclusive gateway, you end it, you merge it, and uh, and that's all, right? So this thing will run in parallel from these things, and here is when the workflow will wait. So if you have other action here, all of this will have to be finished. Both branches will have to be finished when the third action here or the fourth action here gets executed. So just to demonstrate uh, that it did run the both uh, both uh, 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 branches, I will out this as uh, tokens. I'm excited. I haven't seen this work yet. I knew you talked <laughs> about adding it to the product. Didn't know it made it into this release. Yeah. Okay. So now let's uh, test it. Oh, error trying to partially update a record. Uh, so now probably it went on this branch because the case was in progress. So probably I didn't do something right there. Yeah, it's in pro And probably I will just not uh, do this at all because if I do it, then I will not be able to run it again because now it's three and I didn't handle case three. Maybe I will just uh, I will just uh, put a false condition here so this doesn't get executed anymore. Oh, it, it was not used yet. Okay, so now we see that the first is true, the second is true, which means that both branches got executed. And you can see this took three uh, seconds and 58 milliseconds because three seconds was the wait time and probably the rest was just the execution time overall. Um, so, This, uh, this, of course, raises the, uh, the question, what happens, for example, if we had a third variable that we had initialized on both branches? And these are the things that you usually have to be aware when, when doing this kind of uh, parallel execution, because it's not predictable. It will be a race condition, it's called. Who gets to that first or who gets to that last will set the value. So to demonstrate this, let's create, uh, uh, let's create a third one a third parameter, and let's say this uh, uh, first branch. And then uh, let's create here the same token, but this is on the second branch. So which, what value do you think <laughs> the third token will have? Hmm. 
I'm going to go with first branch. See, everything is right here. It's okay. Yes, that is the correct answer because this will execute very fast. This will wait for three seconds. So when this finishes after the three seconds, this has long gone. So this will override this value, basically. Let's uh, let's see how uh, this works. Yes. <clears throat> Good. Now, uh, maybe, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll detail this scenario a bit more because uh, uh, there's some, uh, some aspect we still have to discuss internally. How do we merge these things? But basically, uh, the point that I want to make is if you are going to use variables, initialize variables on both branches that get used afterwards, be aware that there might be race conditions that you don't control and the behavior will be unpredictable. I think that translates um, with great power comes great responsibility, right? We have to figure out how to use this new tool, but I, I can see this being very cool. You're, you're going to go query a system over here. At the same time, you're going to wait for Bazinga to come back with an answer to a question, uh, up, compress all the delays into one rather than doing them in parallel. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, so ideal situation when you use things like that is when you have wait times, like either the processing happens on another system, like in my case on SQL Server, or could be when consuming APIs. So you integrate with a third party system, let's say Twilio, there is an HTTP request, you have to wait for Twilio to finish, maybe let's say it's fast, it's only 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, but still uh, this request will take 158 milliseconds instead of just 50, uh, let's say the biggest one, which would be 100 milliseconds. Good. Uh, any any questions? No, just a continued um, applause. So good deal. Thanks. Wonderful. Uh, so I think I covered uh, uh, everything that I wanted on workflows. And I still have a bit of things to show about the workflows, but I will show them as I move to the API, uh, API screen. So uh, here, the API screen, uh, like I mentioned, software major updates, merging all the standalone API modules into a single place. Of course, I don't have this setup here, and uh, they will, will speak more about it. Uh, but let's, uh, let's edit an API. Let's look at the cases API, the one that returns all the cases. One of the first things that you'll notice is that we split this interface in tabs. So then you have the general setting here, the input parameters. So they are all separated. Uh, this, uh, we, we, we pick this design one because it becomes consistent. We like we did the entities, like we did workflows where you have this tab navigation to switch between various aspects of a, of a component. Uh, but also we heard this feedback a long time from, from, from you that there's too much scrolling in plant data. Okay, so we want to reduce the amount of scrolling up and down to get to, to various things. Uh, good. So uh, maybe uh, maybe to, to wrap up the story on on uh, um, on the workflows, there's uh, there's uh, two things that I would like to show you. One, you see here, I have a read all cases action that is auto generated by me from the end. Uh, for me by the, by the entity builder. And you'll notice a new setting here, caching. So now we are able to cache the output of a read all uh, action. Uh, of course, maybe it doesn't make sense to cache a one million record return uh, result set because that will eat up a lot of memory. But in cases where speed is important, let's say an API that gets called very frequent or a status entity like I have, a status entity likely will never change Right, so that I, I could cache that for days, for weeks. It's very small footprint because I have three, uh, three st statuses, right? so very small memory footprint. And saving that extra query to the database each time I need a status, uh, the, the, the benefits, benefits are huge. So uh, here in the caching sec section, you get to define the caching key. So it's the local developer responsibility to maintain these keys and make sure that you don't put the same key for two different objects because then you'll get into uh, all sorts of crazy situations. Right? So 
but let's say these are my cases. So here you can put any string. Right? Uh, there is a help text here that explains a bit uh, how this works and behind the scenes that we actually uh, compute this uh, with uh, with a prefix so it doesn't conflict with our own keys because then uh, that will be a much bigger mess. You know, if if uh, if you overwrite the built-in plant map caches or the DNN caches, that will get very messy. So we we put a prefix on it, like you see in the description, and afterwards you control the the syntax, the standard, the pattern that uh, it's uh, it's relevant to what you are doing. And then you can to, you get to define how much how much time do you want this cache to to exist. At the end of this time, it will destroy itself. So on next call to this API, the cache will be recreated from the database. So only then a new query will be uh, created. Right. So this is in seconds. So you can put uh, whatever uh, makes sense. Now, what if you need to change it in between? So let's say you have a status entity, but the moment I go to the status page and I have a new status, I want to clear all these caches. caches. So of course, we have the clear cache item action that we had for a while. You know? So here, uh, you would be able to put the same cache key. Uh, of course, you have to uh, make sure to put it uh, with the prefix. Uh, sorry, what was it here? Yeah, to put it with the prefix, uh, prefix as well. You know? So it's entity, the name of an entity, and then your key. And this will clear the cache. So this way, you can also control it programmatically, not just with a, with a time interval. So this, uh, these two features, the parallel gateway and this uh, caching for it all, are meant to improve performance, especially on high volume applications uh, where every millisecond matters because you have thousands of simultaneous uh, requests. So by default, this cache key is off. Anybody yeah. currently using the read all isn't impacted. But if you thoughtfully turn this on, then anywhere you if you were reading cases in an API in one spot or a workflow in another spot, as long as you're using the same cache key, whoever, uh, whichever one completed the uh, read all would generate the results and then the other would be able to consume the results without rereading. Yep. yep. So okay. Safe Maybe... by default, turn it on with um, with some thought behind it. Yes. I will not uh, see this because I don't need it. Uh, and now to finally wrap up the uh, the uh, uh, workflow story. So now I'm executing the progress uh, case uh, workflow. And notice how my parameters will have the help text that I put in. Right. So now if I'm a user of this action, or if, if it's me after two months, I don't have to go what does this parameter does open each action in the workflow. I will know by the description that I wrote here exactly what it does, what it expects, and whatever I want to document in there. Uh, good. And then uh, one final thing I will I will uh, mention because then we have uh, other content from Peter and uh, Dale. Uh, so one of the powerful things that we added in the API Builder is the ability to define your own URLs for the APIs. So why is this important? There are, let's say, mainly two use cases where you would need this. One is versioning. Right? So let's say I had an API to get cases that 100 of my customers use, and now I want to change it. If I would change it, 100 instances will have to upgrade their code, which we all know going back to upgrade an API call in 100 customers is probably going to take years. So now what I would do now with these capabilities, I'll say, OK, I would clone this endpoint. And then I will start some kind of versioning system. And you, you see these APIs uh, with all major vendors, like v1, v2, v3 at the beginning of the URL, and then the, the name of the uh, API method to call. So this is one way to use it. Other patterns could be per customer. So let's say you, you, you have an API that 100 customers use, but you have those three top customers that need very customized APIs, right? So you. Then you say, um, you put a customer name in here, you know, and now they have their own version of the cases. And it's also clear to you that, yeah, this is this customer, this is the other customer, and things like that. So it opens a lot of possibility to create one's own patterns to define in the uh, URLs to the APIs to make sure that you don't hit a, a block 
later when you do need to change APIs or add a new customer or whatever the use case is. Good. So uh, I will stop here. I hope you before, enjoyed this part. Before, before you stop, there was one question. Jim asks whether the cache key feature might head into other actions besides read all. Uh, likely, yes, likely we'll keep extending this, but probably we'll have to rethinking because if we start making it as a shared feature, then we, we want to have maybe better cache management, maybe dependencies between caches. So yeah, likely it will be, it's not a specific plan right now, but it is on the roadmap. Great, thank you. Okay, dokie. All right. So, um, Peter, if you're ready, um, you can take the share and carry on. Take the share. Let's see. Yeah, there I am. Um, share my screen. Uh, let's start with this one. Yes. So, yeah, there are many things we can uh, show in version 126, but... Uh, I will uh, show some uh, small little things on listings, and um, these are the following things. So we added the option to uh, add a status to, uh, or no, not to add a status, to, to show the status uh, of last saved on uh, on listings. And where you can see that is, is here. So here we've got my, uh, my listings, uh, simple listings, and when you go to uh, the gear and you go to the uh, edit page of listings uh, you can see here this there are the dates uh, the data but uh, under settings all the way down the bottom you see here in gray a little text Peter? line that says i'm yeah. sorry dale yeah you're you're still showing the um, slide and not your screen ah uh, how can i do that Okay, sorry about that. Uh, let's escape this. Maybe that's better. So if I switch now, you see my screen. Uh, we my are looking at your, screen. We're look, we're looking at the slide from the presentation. Still, okay. Yes. Then I have to share. Screen two, maybe this will be. It. So now you see the screen. Let's go back. Yes. So Are you looking at my uh, plant and app screen? Yeah, yes. So okay. So what I was talking about. Uh, so when you go into edit mode and you go to the listings page, and you go to the settings tab. In the settings tab, you will see all the way down the bottom, the revision of this particular module. So you see the, num the, the number of times it has changed, uh, edited, and the last one, uh, who did it, and on what date he, he did it. This feature is available in uh, forms, listings, and tabs. So you can uh, sort of check this, uh, the last change and uh, who did that change. So that could be helpful for people who want to know uh, when did somebody and who did it and uh, if there are changes. We also have that on also on our default uh, pages that are created. So that gives uh, Plant and App as a support uh, uh, service uh, when if a client has changed the screen or not. That's sort of how we can use that. So another thing I will show is, uh, yeah, better search for actions in the action list. Uh, so if you go to an action list, uh, either that can be in listings or in, uh, in forms, and you do uh, an Let's wait on the screen and you have a button and you have here a list of actions and you want to add a certain action. You can search here because, uh, well, the, the list of actions we have is quite big. So uh, for instance, if you search for uh, for date, you get all the dates, uh, everything which is, uh, which is in date. Um, 
you may be wondering what I'm seeing here. Well, this is done by Fuzzy Search. And Fuzzy Search is uh, actually looking at all the characters in this, uh, in this text. And it looks up if the order of these uh, these uh, characters is somewhere in this action. So you get to see much more, but uh, that also helps you find things uh, easier. So for instance, here you see create update tokens because uh, date is in there. You will see that. Uh, here you see uh, the D of uh, code, the A of N, the T of stop, and the E of execute. So therefore, this one is in the list. If you want to, uh, if you want to be more specific, for instance, here we got that uh, that date. Let me see where that doesn't really matter what I do. So if you want to see, uh, you want to have uh, uh, less items, for instance, you want to search for Razor, uh, you can, so of course, uh, search for Razor and you see the other one as well. But if you finish up, you will get the only uh, item there is. So uh, we added this, this feature to uh, make it easier to find stuff. And uh, we had the, uh, the remark that uh, people could not find the actions uh, which were there because they, the list was often, uh, often blank. So now you have a much more powerful ability to find stuff. Uh, what else can I show? Let's go back to my uh, screen. Uh, so that is, uh, yeah, localization. Uh, localization is, of course, uh, for people uh, who are not native, uh, applying or developing uh, stuff for other languages. We also have uh, now the uh, a better option to uh, to show uh, date times. And let's see, maybe this one is better. Yeah. So now we are on the uh, US language. So if I go to site settings and I uh, switch language and also, for instance, uh, create a duct language and uh, Go back to the screen. You see here now we got a locale in inside the URL, but uh, we are still on the US. So if I now switch to uh, to Dutch, so NL slash NL, we see that uh, both the uh, the date time field now is uh, uh, shown as a, a Dutch date time, a long date time. And the salary, which is another value, uh, is also shown in euros. And uh, when I go back to the uh, US side, you will see that it was in 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 dollar. And the uh, the, the comma and the dot, uh, the thousand separator and the decimal separator are also correct. So Thursday, January twenty fifth, uh, becomes uh, donderdag 25 januari. So that is uh, an improvement we made. Um, also, when you, uh, for instance, edit uh, those fields, uh, the, um, let's see, where is this? Oh, it's on the other screen. So if you're going to edit the, the field, and we had some problems with that, that the value of the, uh, of the, um, what is it? The money field was not uh, behaving correctly and it now uh, is better. So there's no a multiplication of the uh, the numbers in inside uh, currency fields. Uh, what else do you want to show? Yes, that's, uh, that's on this tab. Um, we had an issue with, um, the evaluation of tokens. So let's go back to a form. On this form, uh, we have uh, a number of fields that has conditions. So in this case, uh, we have a condition, uh, get query string with the value one, then the field will be shown, but also it does some processing. In this case, we set uh, initial value um, 
or actually in this case, we are testing this out with uh, setting a cookie uh, and the cookie has the uh, the name of hidden text and the value of hidden text one, two, three. And we had the problem that a, um, that tokens were evaluated even when the condition became false. So we corrected this and uh, now it behaves uh, behaves better so that the uh, if there is no if the condition is false uh, the content of init fields or in this case when you go to listings uh, the contents of computed uh, computed fields so in this case uh, we have a computed field and that's called uh, and this the title is address and it uh, has also some uh, some values in it but the tokens uh, are not evaluated if the condition is false so uh, given that we uh, have a lot of things to show more i will give the floor to uh, to dale to get uh, his stories uh, so that is uh, the things i wanted to show I see there's a Perfect. question so, maybe. Um, yeah, so I'm just making sure I understand on that last one. So token evaluation, if if the item in a, in a form, if the if the condition is false, then the tokens that are in initialize are not being displayed. And likewise, uh, they're not being computed at all. And likewise, in a... In a well, listing. I can uh, I can show you that. For instance, we have those, uh, there's cookies. Uh, so let's remove those two. Uh, yeah, that is, uh, that, these are the cookies that was set. So if I, um, if I refresh this, uh, this page, then uh, you will see we have one cookie. Well, maybe it's better to show that in, and when I'm not logged in, because we have lots of cookies here. So just really remove the cookie and I go to and I refresh the page and then you see this cookie is added. Now I add the query string and uh, QS equals one. And you see that uh, there's not a felt uh, present uh, available. That is uh, the hidden field is now visible, but also you see that this, uh, this second cookie is now present and that the cookie or the token inside that uh, that field. So in this case, if I can see that, so the this was a hidden field. It's only uh, the condition is met. So now we are set here in cookie, and that's called hidden text. So cookies uh, or uh, tokens are not evalu uh, evaluated if the condition is false, and we had some issues with that in the past. So. Good. I hope I'm clear now, Dale. Thank you. Yep, I understand. All right, we'll, um, good, let's move on. I'll show some things. I've been uh, given the, let me, let me share here. So um, as part of my job, I get to do the bad news stuff, uh, as, but some good news things. So let's start with the good news. We were, uh, Bogdan mentioned earlier that, um, we were making changes to our upgrade experience and um, what this in, in version 126 what this means is that um, as the upgrade is taking place when you're doing either a, an upgrade or hot fixes uh, we had we found that um, if requests were coming into the site uh, during an upgrade it could interrupt the uh, upgrade or make some things run out of order and the result of that being that the that the upgrade the upgrades were not fully predictable not fully stable uh, we now block external requests to the site while the upgrades are running so you'll want to schedule them when when that's not a problem for you but um, so this way uh, that interference is no longer preventing um, the the things from running in the right order. And so the upgrades are going to be more predictable. We are also changing, and I think uh, if you've followed along with us um, 
uh, for a while, you'll know that many of the of the pages that we put in in the configuration page are actually our own low code. So, for example, the uh, the SQL console is um, is a low code page where we use forms and listings to generate the content that you see on the SQL console, rather than it being uh, coded. Um, uh, something hard-coded into the product. And in the same way, the users page and several other pages are um, are just implemented through forms and listings and, and our tabs product. The updates page now is, is that way as well. So there's many of them. Um, we want to make sure that you have the most current version of those. So when you apply an update, we're now recreating these pages and the other uh, system kinds of things. There's system tokens and system jobs and uh, there are a variety of these, uh, I say jobs, automations. There's a variety of these things that we create for you automatically and now we're recreating for you. So they, they uh, if there's new versions of the update page, for example, that that gets created automatically. Um, so that's just, again, more towards stability. Um, we have some more improvements planned, and so I'm going to veer off for a second and talk about uh, what we plan to do in version 127. Uh, right now, when you click the upgrade uh, to, in, to uh, install either a new update or a hotfix, you get a bouncing plant and app icon, um, which doesn't tell you very much and uh, sometimes never disappeared. That was a, a, a bug that we had. So. Uh, now we're moving to a much more predictable process. You'll see a, here's what we're going to do for you screen after you click that you want to upgrade. And so you'll see the packages that are happening and it will tell you that we're getting to upgrade, for example, to 126 or uh, whatever the hotfix, we're going to install hotfixes, tells you what it's going to do. Um, it's going to remind you that you should always have a backup to restore to unless you're just dealing with a system that is pure development and you're okay to blow it away. And so we're going to ask you, you confirm that you have a backup, that you hit start, and when you do, you're going to now see a, uh, a plant and app uh, screen that is giving you positive feedback about what's happening. If you, uh, it tells you, you know, don't refresh it, you'll see the progress happening, uh, running migration scripts, whatever is going on. So you'll get some nice positive feedback. There is the ability to see details. So if you click see details, uh, it's going to open up, um, flip to showing a, a far more involved screen. So you'll see the times and the steps and uh, whether or not it's done and you can again hide those if you don't if you don't want to see them but um, this is again all about giving positive feedback not just a bouncing plant and app icon it's all about if it's also about if things go wrong um, previously this kind of information about oh something uh, didn't work right was hidden in the logs. If you studied your logs, you could tell uh, that something went wrong or you found out that something went wrong. And uh, if any of you dealt with me on support, no, you'll ask, uh, tell me about that. And I'll say, okay, send me the log. And we dig in to find out what went wrong. But we want that to be very evident if something doesn't work right. So you'll get a screen like this. It'll say something went wrong tells you it's you should uh, open up support ticket uh, and perhaps uh, roll back from backup but uh, it's going to tell you that it, it, that uh, we detected that something went wrong and um, so this should give you a much more um, reliable it either worked or it didn't and uh, know to move on or to uh, to stop there. Uh, hopefully, we, we always advise that you do these um, upgrades uh, if, you, if you have the ability to do it, uh, again, we, either with a backup or, um, but if you can, with a clone. So um, we, we want to make sure that you don't negatively impact your production. So if you do this kind of thing on a clone, you see an error, we work through it so that you know that you know when you get to doing your production system that it's going to work. Anyway, giving you the tools to know what to do next. 
But if everything happens the way it's planned, then uh, you'll see upgrade completed successfully and you'll continue. Um, so that's that's the plan for version 127. That's where we're going with this to try to get some uh, update stability. People who are uh, accessing during the upgrade will see something like this, an application under maintenance and uh, a brief message. And so for that duration, I mean, the, the, the app was already always uh, during the upgrade, it wasn't usable. And now we're telling them that it's not usable. Um, and so your users will, if, if you if you haven't otherwise stopped traffic to your site, uh, they'll see at least this so that they uh, know that it's uh, non-functional and uh, to expect um, a, a change as the update completes. Okay, back to things that are actually going on in version 126. Um, there's this possible uh, breaking change that you need to be aware of. One of the things that we're that's going on behind the scenes is that we are improving our licensing. Our licensing methodology um, has been completely refactored. This is going to allow more flexible uh, things like being able to um, release individual product features so we can come up with a starter plan or things like that. At this release, you shouldn't see anything different. It should work exactly the same way when we uh, and and all the features and everything that you used to should should uh, should not see any changes. But licensing changes are going on underneath the hood. And um, just wanted you to be aware that when a, a licensing issue, uh, when something is restricted by licensing, you'll see this red shopping cart icon and an explanation of, uh, of what happened. So if during the beta period, if you're participating in the beta and something uh, doesn't get licensed correctly, this is what you should expect, a red, uh, a red icon. Send a, send a note to support and we'll sort it out immediately. But um, when, when we roll out our newer, um, our, our, the things that um, this licensing change allows, People uh, who use a, a version of Plant and App that have that don't have automations enabled, for example, will see this red shopping cart and uh, be able to upgrade to uh, to get to it. So that's the intention. That's where we're going. But you shouldn't see anything of that in this particular release. Um, there is another um, breaking or possible breaking issue with forms um, if in the advanced settings display mode, we used to have this uh, feature in separate page. In recent releases, it's not worked anyway. It throws an error. So we're acknowledging that and getting rid of it. It's not a feature that's uh, been used in uh, and, and available in many of the releases. But if you were upgrading from a very ancient version of uh, action form you might see this so it's no longer there we're just removing it again something that shouldn't bother most of you um we were starting with um version 119 which was several years ago we started to we started to provide bootstrap 5 and uh we're moving away from bootstrap 3 bootstrap 3 is still there um so if your forms if you're uh, if you're relying on Bootstrap 3 to display your site, it's now just marking as obsolete. This is just one one step along the path to remind you to uh, to be moving towards Bootstrap 5 and uh, to avoid use of Bootstrap 3 for new uh, implementations. So, uh, and then we're removing some older Bootstrap files. So, um, we're if you're still using Bootstrap 3 or uh, the fact that, that it's available as an obsolete feature, that we still have version 3.41. We apologize, we're going a little bit over time, and uh, this, again, will be out on YouTube if you have to drop away, but we're going to go ahead and finish up uh, what we have planned here. Um, so probably the biggest area that we worked this last time in, this, in version 126 was in APIs. APIs previously were a module and you could have different modules on your site that uh, that handled APIs. Now it's a core feature. It's not implemented uh, separately as a module. So all of your APIs are going to be in one place. 
That also meant that uh, previously you could call APIs with an endpoint name and this long, uh, so whatever your site was, you could say desktop modules, DNN sharp, DNN endpoint, and give it a method name. This method name is no longer supported. So if you have either in your applications or if you've given out an API to clients that use this older notation, it has been available for a long time to do it either way with this method, uh, but now it's just going to be site slash API slash endpoint name. So if you've given that information out to clients, you're going to want to make sure that they call it, that they know to, uh, to use the correct uh, API call to get to your site. So that's uh, one thing. And then in the same area, again, it's all about, it's, it's not, it's no longer a module. So um, in, within our product, there, uh, there has been an action that says execute an API. So you could be in a form and you could call an API that's been defined on your site and retrieve information from the API. We are deprecating this feature. It's not going to be available as an action to select anymore. The, uh, the reasoning is that um, that execute API method select, uh, it made you select a, an API using, a, using the um, module ID of the API, and uh, it doesn't exist anymore. So we are, uh, we've made a, a bridge so people that already have this feature enabled in their site, it will work but we're uh, we're not allowing you to select to execute API methods anymore as an action. There's workarounds for that. If you want to call it by way of a server request, it will continue to work. Um, most of the time, this was something that people were using the APIs uh, because earlier versions of our product didn't have workflows, so APIs kind of filled in as workflows. So we're now saying you really should replace these with workflows. Or if you're actually using the capabilities of uh, uh, some of the capabilities like caching of your, of your APIs, you'll call it with server request instead of execute API method. Anyway, um, not going to break you with this release, but uh, you should um, move away from that. All right, that's what I have. Uh, that's uh, what the team has for you today. There's, uh, we're we're not in a rush to get away. So if you have any last minute questions, do uh, you can still ask them. Other than that, um, we look forward to talking about these more. We will uh, entertain questions and have a copy of version one twenty six up and available uh, when we get together for low code campfire on Friday. And as Bogdan hinted, we uh, plan to start the beta period on Friday for anyone who wants to get access to the beta. Campfire is a good place to show up and talk about that with us. So given that there are no new questions, I'm going to call it uh, here. Thank you, Peter and Bogdan, for uh, your presentations today. It's always good to have company on the Low Code Cafe. We will see you again in two weeks. Talk soon. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.